There is a learn it and you have to live it attitude. There's four sections, reading, listening, writing, and speaking. Um, some people need help with other sections besides speaking and listening. You know, the, the live it part is really that, that speaking and listening part. So I recently interviewed Josh McPherson, a teacher who specializes in helping students like you to pass English proficiency exams like the TOEFL and the Duolingo test. In this video, we are sharing seven tips that he gave to help you pass these exams. We're also going to learn vocabulary while having fun. We'll be defining the interesting, more difficult vocabulary that Josh uses, and we'll use example clips from Friends, How I Met Your Mother, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and other funny TV series. And if you are new here, well, every week we help you to understand fast-speaking natives without getting lost, without missing the jokes, and without subtitles. Like Lasley, who says that our lessons are helping him to improve his IELTS score. So we want to help you with your English learning goals too, but we can only do that if you hit that subscribe button and the bell down below. Josh and I talked about something that, more than a practical tip that you can use, is a philosophy, an attitude. It's the idea behind our motto at Real Life English, don't just learn it, live it. So Josh said that to pass an exam like TOEFL or IELTS, you need a mix of, on the one hand, doing some good old studying. On the other hand, you need to also make English a part of your life. You know, the, the live it part is really that, that speaking and listening part, but there are students who need help with writing. Uh, and that's a very kind of personal thing that you just kind of do on your own. Um, and reading as well is a very kind of personal thing that you do on your own. So I, I do find that, so, that there are students who strengths are in living it that are better, stronger at speaking and listening. And there's people who are a bit stronger in reflecting on it and, and kind of uh, digging deep into books and things like that that prefer the reading and writing part. My advice usually kind of depends on the student and what they're kind of going through at that time. So what type of student or learner are you? Are you a student that likes to sit down, study, and dig deep into English? Or have you made English a part of your life and most of your learning is by immersion? Well, let me know down in the comments below. I'd love to hear and learn more about you. And the great thing about you doing this is that it helps us to make better and more useful lessons for you. And there's people who are a bit stronger in reflecting on it and, and kind of uh, digging deep into books and things like that. In a literal sense, to dig means what you see here. But if you dig deep into a subject, you try to learn about it by investigating or reflecting on it. In these examples, it is used more with the meaning of think deeply. Okay, just so we're clear, from this point forward, my call sign will be Deathblade. And I'll be Rum Tum Tugger. No, Boyle, no characters from Cats. Dig deep, think of something scary. Okay, we're down to the final four. What do you think, people? Come on, dig deep. Now, Josh will give you six tips that will help you to choose the right test for you and pass it. Tip one. You know, there's so many tests out there. There's, you know, the TOEFL that you specialize in. There's the IELTS, the Cambridge, the Duolingo. How can learners choose what is the best test for them? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I, I would say that um, figure out what you need the test for and ask that institution what test they take. You know, so that's the most practical thing. Tip two. One thing I will say about these tests, IELTS and TOEFL in particular, is that the they are pretty dense. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that it's hard to figure out what's going on in these tests. It takes a bit of time. You really have to like sit down one day or two days and just and just kind of spend the day wrapping your head around the test, you know. If you wrap your head around something, you succeed in understanding something that is challenging or confusing. IELTS and TOEFL are complex tests, so you need to wrap your head around the different things that make them up. Okay, okay, look, I need you to wrap your head around this, okay, because it is happening. Now, the most widely used tests are the IELTS and the TOEFL exams. As Josh said, those tests are a bit complex. If you're interested in taking a test to track your progress in English, you should consider another test that's growing in popularity. The one that has the lowest barrier of entry in terms of like uh, learning about is the new one, the Duolingo English test. That, that's the one that to me is the easiest one to understand. Um, you'll take a practice test. There's only 10 different question types. It's pretty clear what you have to do. Josh describes the Duolingo English test as having a low barrier to entry. This is an advanced term. 
You can use it to describe something that is less complicated compared to other similar things. You could describe the same idea in a simpler way by saying something is more accessible. Example, for a Spanish speaker, Italian is more accessible to learn than Chinese. Or, Italian is a lower barrier to entry for a Spanish speaker than is Chinese. Many institutions and universities now accept the Duolingo test in addition to TOEFL and IELTS to show your English proficiency. So you may want to look into it as a simpler alternative that you can take at home. Tip three. You try to do it on your own for as long as possible. Um, and then either you pass or you get to a point where you, you need somebody to kind of explain what's going on. You know, like, like what, what's missing? What, what do I need to do? There's something missing. I don't know what it is. Can you, can you explain it to me? By the way, in addition to having a mentor or a teacher, it can be helpful to have a support group. Maybe that is your wife or your husband or your parents or your friends. But maybe the people closest to you can't really relate so closely because they are not learning English themselves. Now, with our real life app, anytime and anywhere, you can jump on and meet other learners just like you from other parts of the world. Now, not only will you practice your speaking, which will undoubtedly help you on any exam, but you will also make English speaking friends who know exactly what you're going through and can offer you that support and even advice that you so desperately crave. And in addition to this, you will take your native comprehension to the next level with full length interviews with the best teachers and experts like Josh and an interactive transcript and vocabulary definitions. And guess what? It's all absolutely free. I bet this all sounds too good to be true, right? But it really is true. Just like Jadeja, who said that the app has even helped them with their pronunciation. So you can check it out right now by clicking up here or down the description below. Or you can simply search for real life English in the Apple app or Google Play Store. Now the next tip that's going to help you be successful in your preparation for an exam is knowing exactly when you're going to be taking it. Tip four. So well, one thing is that I would say to set a, set a date, um, you know, when you want to take the test, uh, setting a date will make it a little bit more real. And then you want to make a plan about uh, how you want to study. Usually I recommend people have a kind of overall plan, not very specific, but just, um, just something like uh, how many tests you plan on taking before the test, how many que practice questions you want to answer, what courses you want to take, very general. And then what I would do is try to set up your schedule. I always give a, the example of uh, people who are on a diet and they, they cook all their lunches on Sunday. They have them all prepped and ready to go. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they don't have to think. They could just take their, their lunch and not think about it. You want to do the same thing for TOEFL because what's going to happen is, is that every day you're going to sit in front of the computer and you're going to say, okay, time for me to study TOEFL. What am I going to do? And then you're spending 10, 20 minutes trying to look at what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. It's much better to kind of plan everything out for the week. So, you know, OK, on Monday, I'm going to I'm going to do this video and answer these questions on Tuesday. I'm going to do this video and answer these questions on Wednesday. I'm going to do this again. So you kind of know what to do every day and then you kind of tweak it as you go. When you tweak something such as a system or way of doing something, you make small changes to improve the way it works. For example, if you're working on the writing part of your exam, it's advisable that you review your text before handing it in and make some tweaks or tweak it if necessary. Tip five. A lot of times when I meet students, they'll say that they're gonna study four hours a day, you know, something crazy. I would recommend being very practical. Um, if you're introducing something new in your life, it's gonna be hard to, to kind of make a habit of it. So anyway, just, just take it slow um, and expect that it's um, not gonna go as planned and that's totally okay. So instead of giving yourself a difficult or unrealistic goal, like studying for two hours every day, start small. What's the minimum that you can do every day to develop the studying habit? Even just starting with five minutes per day to get a very low barrier to entry routine going. And then increasing the amount of time that you spend daily will be much more effective for most people. Now, if you set a goal of studying for hours every day and then fail at keeping it up, you will just become disappointed and may give up altogether. So as Josh said, you should take it slow. This means you're going to progress in your studies in a slow and careful and measured way. 
Which of these do you think is the opposite of taking it slow? Run, rush, dash. If you're keen on romantic comedies, you've probably seen that couples might want to take it slow, meaning they don't want to get into committed relationship too quickly or rush into anything. You know, they're not gonna get married anyway. What? Come on, they rushed into this thing so fast, it's ridiculous. I mean, they're gonna be engaged for like, what, a year? Tip six. Take a practice test and kind of gauge where you're at, see how much you think you need to improve, mm -hmm. um, and, and then take it from there, yeah. So I, I would gauge where you're at first before you start. A gauge is this object. For example, on your card dashboard, you can see a fuel gauge. It's also the instrument with which you can check the air pressure of your tires. That's a pressure gauge. As a verb, we can use gauge in other ways too. It means to measure or calculate something by using a particular instrument or method. You can gauge your English level by taking a practice test and getting a score. Would you like to stay at my guest house? Yeah, thanks. When's good to go over there? Oh, I'm not offering. I'm just taking a survey to gauge general interest. Josh said a practice test would help you gauge where you're at. This is another way you can use to talk about your progress in your language learning or other things. By the way, if you want to gauge where you are at, you should totally check out this lesson. Tip seven. And if I had it like right there, you're not allowed to have your phone, obviously. I think even like a smartwatch or anything like that probably wouldn't be allowed. But if you just had like a little analog clock or anything like that, that you could have there and like to, to really pace yourself. Right, yeah, that's something that, you know, a teacher might know, but then you would never think about. You know, there's all these little things that kind of come up with these tests that, that are really helpful that you just, one tiny little thing can make a really big difference. So you do definitely want to prepare and, and try to seek out some advice if you can. Time yourself and pace yourself are similar expressions. As a noun, your pace is the speed you walk or move. If you pace yourself while doing something, you control the time it takes you to do it. Usually, this infers that you are doing it in a careful and measured way. So for example, if you run a marathon, it is really important to pace yourself. You don't want to start off running too fast and use up all of your energy. It is the same thing in an exam setting. You don't want to rush or waste too much time in each of the parts of the test. If you pace yourself properly, you won't run out of time and submit an incomplete test sheet, and you will probably make less mistakes. Yeah, I just uh, finished sewing this top to bottom. Now I'm gonna sew it side to side. <laughs> pace yourself. <laughs> One tiny little thing can make a really big difference, so you, you do definitely wanna prepare and, and try to seek out some advice if you can. Josh also says that you should consider seeking out help if you need it. Seek is another word for look or for search. The past tense of this word is sought. You can also say it as a phrasal verb, seek out. Why do you think we keep ending up together? New Year's, who invited who? Valentine's, who asked who into whose bed? I did, but- You seek me out. Something deep in your soul calls out to me like a foghorn. All right, so let's recap what you've learned today. So Josh gave you some orientation about how to choose the test that is right for you. After that, you need to spend some time figuring out how they work, wrapping your head around it as he said. The other tips are to get a mentor or a teacher, set a date for your examination to make it real and put pressure on yourself. Set a realistic goal. That is start small, baby steps, and then build from there. Then take practice tests. You don't want to make your official examination your first experience with the test. Lastly, you might want to take a watch so that you can pace yourself, but not like this one because it has to be one that is not digital. So something that's not fancy at all, that's not connected to the internet. If you do those formalized tests, they do kind of force you into uncomfortable things. And hopefully you consider it a growing experience. Um, that's one thing that I, I kind of like about teaching these tests is that it, it gives you a clear goal, you know, like, um, saying you want to be fluent in English, uh, saying you want to speak more English, you want to learn more vocabulary. I was teaching advanced level students in the States and you know, it's, it's hard to kind of really measure your progress when you get to the, that higher level. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're at a very advanced level of English, but they're still not happy. You know, they, they feel like there's still things missing. And then it just becomes really hard to track. What am I missing? What do I need to do? And, and so 
these tests, while they're pretty stressful and, and um, you know, for some people, they, they take up quite a bit of time. Uh, I think for a lot of people, it is a kind of proof of what you did, you know, like of your accomplishments.